Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Indie Interactive, where we talk about making great music, connecting with your audience, and growing your business. My name is Bree Noble. I am the founder of Women of Substance Radio Podcast and the Female Entrepreneur Musician. That is the page you're on right now. I'm also the founder of the Female Musician Academy, and today I am super excited to have my friend Greg Wilna on the uh, Indie Interactive today, and we are going to be talking about money blocks. Now, many of you know I have an upcoming summit, an online conference called the Profitable Musician Summit. Greg is one of the speakers, and the summit is all about making income as a musician and um, 32 different income streams talked about by 39 different experts. And so the reason I wanted to do this episode of Indie Interactive and bring Greg on is because I know that we cannot really dig into these income streams and really knowing, you know, how to employ the tactics and everything that we learn if we've got this mindset issues going on in the background, these what I call money blocks these limiting beliefs that tell us that we can't make money as musicians, we don't deserve it, all the different things that kind of go on subconsciously that we might not even realize are going on in the back of our mind. So that's why I brought Greg on. So I want to have him um, introduce himself and just let him know a little bit about himself and his background while you guys are showing up. If you have any questions about you know, how to deal with starving artist syndrome, money blocks, limiting beliefs, all that stuff, throw them in the chat. And I'm going to have him, you know, kind of talk about this from the perspective of his own perspective. And then like a musician that he was working with that he, um, that, that dealt with this money block thing and actually eventually like succumbed and never was able to really make money from music, which is sad and just gave up. So we don't want this to happen to you guys. So that's why I'm bringing him on today. So um, just so you know, for some reason, Zoom's not allowing me to show his video, but you'll see his picture and you'll hear him talking. So um, just have, I'll have him introduce himself and make sure that you guys know where he's coming from and I'll get all this other stuff set up. So Go ahead, Greg. Hey, Bree. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. As Bree said, my name is Greg Wilna. I'm the founder of MusicianMonster.com and Musician Monster Podcast. And just a little bit of back, a little bit of background about myself. I got started playing in live bands um, locally um, for about ten or fifteen years. I was doing regular bar gigs, and I wasn't making any money. And after a while, it kind of gets pretty frustrating to practice and perform and play gigs, unload, upload your equipment, and to do that for a long period of time. In the beginning, it you know it's pretty <coughs> fun, but after a long period of time, you know, <laughs> it really starts to suck. So what happened was, is I ended up getting kind of exhausted and frustrated about not earning any income, and I ended up giving up, all right? So I decided that all my friends and family were right. I, was, I needed a plan B. I needed to get serious about earning income from a way that was dependable and start thinking about my family, that, 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 I, I'm sure you've heard it all before. So what happened was, is I decided to do that. And for the next few months, I ended up feeling like I didn't have a purpose, you know? Like I missed music a lot. And so instead of deciding to focus on my job and the things that other thing, some of the other things that some of the people were telling me I needed to focus on, I made a decision. And that decision was, I'm going to figure out how to earn income uh, from the gigs that I was already playing. And when I made that decision, it was like, you know, an aha moment, the light bulb went on, whatever cliche, you know, you want to insert there. I realized that the reason I hadn't made money before was because I was waiting for somebody else to come along and do it for me. And because of that simple subconscious decision, I had never decided to make it happen for myself. And then when I realized that, I went home from my job, which I was a construction worker at the time. I went home and I sketched up a few steps, a few things that I needed to do to, to start earning income from the gigs that I was already playing. And then about a month later, after making... Zero, I mean like zero from live music for years. I made 
$800. And then the next month after that, I made over a thousand and then it just grew from there. But it all started because I made the decision to overcome some of those money blocks and then take steps, um, actionable steps to earn dependable income from, from my live music. And a lot of the things that Bree and I are going to talk about today are going to be things that are highly relevant no matter the situation you're in with your music. You can start employing some of these techniques and get some actionable advice to overcome some of these money blocks. I think a lot of the problem is, Bri, I'm, let me know whenever you're ready. I'm, I I'm just want to make sure you have enough time to do what you need to do. Yeah, no, lot, keep going. Go ahead. I'm, I'm enjoying listening. <laughs> okay, good. That's always good. Um, a lot of the problems with these money blocks is they're all subconscious. You know, we don't, we aren't aware of them. So if you're not aware of them, you can't do anything about them. So what we want to do today is we want to make you maybe um, more aware of some of those things and then give you some actionable things that you can do once you're aware of them to change them. And I'm telling you, if you do that, you, you will see results. It's like, it's just crazy what happens when you make the decision to earn income doing what you love and then take responsibility for it and then take action on it. Yeah. Oh man. So much. So um, I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments if there's ever been a time, and I always ask this question on my podcast of my guests, because I think it's really important. Is there ever a time that you either wanted to give up on your music because you felt like this, you weren't making enough money and you never were going to be able to, or that you actually gave up, like Greg said, and then he came back to it because that, that purpose is just so deep within you that you can't ignore it. So if you, any of you want to share an experience like that. I'd love to hear that in the chat. I also want to make sure and say hi to everybody that showed up so far. We have Beth and Matungi and Annie and Marie and let's see who else. And Christina, that's who I see so far. Great to have you guys here today. Um, hey everyone. So, so Greg, I'd love to have you kind of talk about, cause I was really intrigued when you told me that story about the musician that you met. Um, Mm, then yeah. had this conversation with him about why he wasn't making money and, you know, tried to get out of him, like the things that were keeping him from making money and why, you know, he eventually never did make money yeah. from music. Cause he wasn't really, you know, you were trying to get through to the, those deep rooted things that were keeping him from doing that. And he never did deal with those. So why don't you right. tell them a little bit about the conversation you had with him and then we'll talk about the things that come out of that. Yeah, sure. So when I came back to music and playing playing regular gigs, uh, a buddy of mine was a front man in a local band and he saw that um, the drastic shift that had happened from before when he knew me and then after, after I made this decision. And he sent me a message on Facebook asking me uh, for some tips and some advice on how he could have some of the results that I was having. And I asked him a few questions. And one of the questions I asked him was if he had a way uh, to earn income from the gigs that he was playing. And he told me that he had t-shirts, right? And I asked him to show me some pictures of these t-shirts. And they were like, they were awesome. You know, they were so cool to come to find out that he'd sell out of them at every gig. So one of the things that I asked him that was holding him back, it wasn't the t-shirts, but he said that he didn't want to take money from people to get where he wanted to go. And I think that was his fundamental stumbling block. There were some other things that we'll talk about later, but one of the shifts that occurred in my mind was that in order to become successful, there's often this lie that we're told um, and that in that you have to be dishonest in order to become so. So in his mind, he believed that to get successful, he had to earn income and to earn income, he had to, meant take taking money from other people. And one of the big shifts that occurred in my mind was that I realized that you cannot take money from people and do this. People freely choose to give you their money because they want to show their appreciation for the value that you're adding to their life through your music. And then once I shifted that mindset, it gave, I gave myself permission to feel okay and even excited 
about res- letting people give me their money because I knew that I was doing something valuable and that them giving their money to me was an exchange of value instead of me just taking money from them. And that's something that he never allowed himself to believe. It was always, I have to take people's money in order to be successful. And I don't want to do, do that. Therefore, I would rather choose um, to not be successful, to be poor. And that is just not true. Well, and a big part of this is believing in the value of your music, right? Yes. In believing that what you have is worth something. I mean, if you think about, like, if you're being really rational about this, right? Okay, I need some food. A farmer grows some food. I need to buy it from him in order to survive. Or I want to eat food. I'm hungry. I like it. All that stuff. Um, let's just take survival out of it. Let's let's choose a food that doesn't, you know, you don't have to have to survive. Um, you know, I can't think of a particular one right now, but let's say strawberries or something like that. Like that farmer is creating that thing for me. I give him money for it. And then I get to enjoy the food and he is earning his living. And it's just the same with the musicians. It's not like I'm taking you know, the farmer is taking money from me. Like I can choose to buy something else. I could choose to buy oranges or meat or any of the other things. Right. But I chose to buy strawberries because that's what I wanted. And I chose to give that farmer my money. And so, you know, I think we just, we need to think about it that way, but I have definitely encountered people and I've probably been there myself along the way back in the day about, you know, feeling like I'm taking, like, I don't have the right to take something from someone. And I think a lot of that stems from feeling like your CD is not worth, like, say you're selling your CD for 15 bucks. Do you really feel that your CD is worth that $15? And if you really think about what you put, the blood, sweat, and tears you put into that CD, not to mention all the money you put into it, all the time, all your creativity, all that. And I, it's one thing I love that, um, that Tara talks about when she talks about figuring out what you should pay, get paid for gigs. Like she talks about all the things that you put into a gig, not just the time that you're on the stage, you know, all the years of uh, learning that you've done, schooling, all that stuff, you know, that all has culminated into this little package that is your CD that you're selling to somebody. And so you need to think about it that way versus like, you know, sometimes we feel when we first come out with a CD, like we want people to hear it. And so we give a lot of them away. And I think that devalues it in our mind as well. So I'd love to hear from you guys in the chat. Like, have, have you experienced these kinds of feelings about your own music? Um, and do you think this is affecting how you feel about charging for your music? see what people are saying. And while people are commenting, I wanted to, something that um, came up that when you kind of gave me a summary of what this guy had to say is that he, he did not come from money. And I think that that was part of it too. He had always had to struggle for money. You know, being poor was kind of in his blood needing to struggle. And so how do you think that affects people when they're approaching, you know, being a musician and trying to make money from that? Yeah. So for me, I mean, I can only, I only have what I've experienced, right. And then I can relate back through others and just kind of filter that through my perceptions and then contrast the difference based on my own uh, experiences. But when you're born without a lot of money and which I was, it's difficult to see yourself as being worth a certain amount. So you almost expect not to earn income, you know, mm. and it kind of affects you in a way, in the way that you're getting the results that you expect. And you don't really know what it feels like to earn income doing something that you love. And then also to earn income consistently to the point that you can leave your job um, and replace that with, because you've replaced that income doing what you love. And I think that's one of the biggest things is when you see yourself in a role that you expect yourself to be, you don't demand anything greater of yourself. Um, So it's kind of like the same old, same old. 
And so you don't expect anything different, almost as if you're becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're like, oh, well, I'm just supposed to be here. I'm supposed to starve. I'm not supposed to get paid. Musicians today aren't supposed to be successful. You're getting the results you expect. So when you shift that, when you start seeing yourself in the way that you want to be or the way that you're worth, your image of yourself shifts. And because you see yourself differently, you start acting differently. And when you start acting differently, you start getting different results and you start getting paid more. And it's just this perception that has to change in your own mind's eye um, before you can start acting in a way that is different than what you've acted before that's gotten you similar results. And it's really difficult to do that when you don't know that that's kind of what's going on. Um, and until you do, like I said, you're kind of unaware of it and you can't really do anything about it. So one of the things I started doing and what I suggested to my friend is to start thinking of himself differently. And instead of expecting those results that he's always received, um, to start expecting different results and to start vi envisioning himself successful and start envisioning what it would be like and what he wanted his life to be like once he had reached the success that he had wanted. And that's really hard to do because we feel that we don't deserve it sometimes. But like I said, when your perceptions shift, that you're adding value, you know, that people's lives are changing because of your music, you start to give yourself permission to think that way. Yeah. And I've and interviewed I a lot of people who have come from parents who were either professional musicians or professional artists, and they have a completely different mindset. Like they've had this model growing up of you can make money and be an artist and it is an actual career choice. And their mindset is so different. Like they just, it never occurred to them that they'd be a starving artist. And, you know, maybe they came from somebody who was a session player or played on stage with some really well-known people. And so mm -hmm they had that modeling at home. I think that really helps too. And I love this comment from Annie. She says, I wish we didn't say we play music, but we could say we work music. And I like that. Like on our end, we do work music. Our audience gets to play, but we're working. And so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I play music. It, yeah, it, it kind of has play has this double connotation that maybe can make it sound like we're doing it for a hobby or it's just for fun. And so I think that's a really good point of thinking about it as work. Yeah. So if you, that's, that brings up a good point because if you think about yourself in that way, see a lot of, including myself before I would say, I want to play music full time or I want to play music. You know, that was my goal. Um, but to play music full time is a totally different goal, right? Because most of us are already playing music. But if you want to play music full time or, or, or earn income from it, that's a totally different goal. Like mm -hmm. if you want to play music, you're already playing music. You know, you just keep doing it. So there's no incentive to change the way you think about it. But if you want to do it full time or if you want to earn income from it, that's a totally different goal. And it requires a totally different way of thinking about how to approach it. Yeah. And, you know, Beth makes a really good point. And I had this problem, too, when I first started. Um, because she's a Christian artist and oh, cool. people tend to think that we should, it's a ministry, we should work for free, you know? And I just always reminded people like, does the pastor work for free? You know, does the event coordinator at the church, most of the time they don't work for free if they have a good one. I mean, they may have amazing volunteers, but most of the time, if a church does a lot of events, if, you know, they have a big women's ministry, any of those things that they actually want to do well, they have a paid employee and mm -hmm. you know, it's the same. Like you are performing. If you want to do a good job at it and they want you to be a good, you know, presentation for their audience and their church, then they can't expect you to do it for free. They could pull in any, any musician off the street to do that. You know, right. they're going to want someone professional. And I always used to say, you know, in order to keep this ministry going, like if you are a religious performer in order to keep this ministry going, I have to charge. Cause this is, this is my full-time job. It's just like being a missionary. Like you can't expect missionaries to go into the field without any support. <laughs> they still need exactly. to live. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think we need to, and, and I, I totally get that Beth because I went through the same thing as well. And I just had to learn how to talk about it and to be bold yes. about it with, 
with the people that were making the decisions and say, you know, help them understand how to approach a musician in that way. Yes. I can totally relate to that too. Um, And it's a lot harder to expect yourself to get paid. And then when you, when you expect yourself to get paid because you understand and you believe um, that uh, in the value that you're bringing and when you see yourself differently about that, about earning that income, it becomes a lot easier to um, convey with conviction to that other person who expects it for free, why you don't do that and why you can't do it. And that conviction comes across in a way that is, um, you know, very believable and because it's the truth and the perceived value of your services increase because you aren't demanding because you're demanding to get paid for them. So when you demand to get paid for something and you get paid for something, the person who is receiving those services from you automatically increases. It automatically increases a perceived value that they have of those services. Absolutely. It's so true. No, it's so true. I mean, for example, with the Academy, like if I were to just give all that training away for free, people wouldn't value it. They wouldn't use it, but if they know they're paying for it and it's the same when I take other people's courses and, you know, Greg has a course too. So he understands this. Like if you just give it to people for free, they won't value it and they won't say, oh my gosh, you know, I need to get my money's worth out of this. Yeah. And it's the same thing with like a, a gig, you know, if you, if you charge, then that, that church or whoever it is, is going to say like, we need to make the most of this. We need to do a lot of, of promotion and get a lot of people there and all that. Cause we're paying for this. Yeah. That's absolutely one of the true. fears too. Oh, one, one of the fears too. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, let's go ahead. So one of the fears that you have to overcome in this, and I can totally relate to, because sometimes you're afraid not to charge because you don't want to lose the opportunity to do the gig. Mm-hmm. All right. And that's totally understandable. But you have to get over it knowing that there are some gigs that you are going to lose out on and that it's a process of learning how to demand income, getting exchanging income for your services. But one of the things that is critical is that, like I was saying earlier, playing gigs for free is exhausting. Like you don't realize, like it's not sustainable. So you have to know, you have to tell yourself if you believe in the value that you're, that you're providing and you want other, you want to extend your ability, right. To continue to add that value to others. You have to get paid. If you don't get paid, you can't do that. So that's one of the things that has really helped me with conviction, feel okay about demanding to get paid for it and then conveying it to the people in a way that they respect and that they perceive as, you know, worth, you know, worth those services for what they're paying for. So yeah, I hope and this that guy helps. that we were talking about, you know, that Greg knows, like he eventually just gave up because he was burnt out. He was bored of doing the same thing over and over again without getting a result, you know, and he was just, just done. And he lost all of his passion for music. And I don't want that to happen to you guys. So that's why we're talking about this. Um, Carlene has a really good comment about, so she has a CD coming out soon and she's got a, a CD release party and she's, just still uncomfortable about she feels like it's going to be awkward to ask people to buy them buy her cds even though she's got somebody else manning the table and all that stuff you know all the suggestions that we make so i think greg can really speak to this because even in the beginning like he didn't even have a cd to sell he kind of made one um and how did (laughs) how did you start i think this is a funny story about how you started asking for people to to give you money yeah. Okay. So I could totally relate, totally relate to what you're saying because I hate, if there's one, I really hate the pressure that we're told like online musicians, you know, we need to learn business. We need to learn sales and all this stuff. Like that totally turns me off. And I still hate the idea of trying to get people to buy my music or asking people to buy it. So what I had to do is I had to change the way I thought about it because that was a money block. So what did I, what I ended up doing was I ended up create, I ended up using something that I now refer to as what I call the CD donation strategy. 
And what it is, since you have a CD release party coming up, it'll work even better for you than if you could use this strategy to bootstrap as well. But so what I do is I have a demo version of my CD and then I have the full version of it. And I have a flat price on the full version, like say $15. And then what I do is I do a donation based model for the CD demos. And what it is, is I don't charge anything. I just say, here's, here's some, here's my music. Give what you want. If you think that it's worth X, you know, you can donate whatever you prefer. If you don't think it's anything, if it's worth anything, you can take it free of charge. It's totally up to you. So the way that came about was I was so sick of not earning an income from my music. And I didn't have a professional CD like you had to sell. But what I did have was some demo CDs on my brother's computer, right? Just rough, awful sounding tracks that we were using to write with. And we would listen to them on our own and then would write off of that to improve them. So what I did is I burned three of those onto a CDRW, 10 of those, and I slid them into a CD envelope. And then I took that to my gig the next day. We played the gig. And then afterwards, people came up to us and they're like, oh, you're so good. Thanks. You know, I really appreciated that. And then is there any way that I can get a hold of your CD? And then I was like, um, I thought about the CD in my pocket. Okay. And I... I was like, I don't feel comfortable asking for money for this guy. So instead of being, you know, this salesman trying to convince him to buy my stuff, I did something totally different. I leveled with him. I said, yeah, man, I've got a CD, um, but it's just a demo. I don't feel comfortable charging you for these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and give this to you and you can give me whatever you want. If you want to give me five bucks for it, that's cool. If you don't, you know, just take it. I appreciate, you know, the opportunity and I hope you enjoy, enjoy the music. So the guy reaches into his pocket and hands me $13. Okay. And I was like, holy crap, this is awesome. Here it went for me expecting I had to be this salesman who had to convince people to buy my stuff to being this just organic conversation that allowed me to be uh, totally honest and natural and build a relationship with this person. And so I employed that, I guess, basic script or technique or whatever for the rest of the night. And I had over, I had almost $100 in my pocket. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is you can use the CD donation strategy to authentically sell your music and use it as an opportunity to get the relationship off on the right foot. But you don't don't think you have to be a salesman in order to sell your music. You just have to be honest and have a way to authentically communicate to another person why your music is worth paying for and then give them the opportunity to, to do so. So I'll, I'll wrap this up with saying you have a great way to contrast the value of your CD, the full price, with the donation-based CDs, if that's something you want to do. So what it'll do is if you have your CDs displayed on a table um, and you have the CD demos that you take out through the crowd or ask for donations for, what will happen if you want to do this? Okay, this is just an example. What will happen is people will see the value that you're setting, the flat amount for the, for the regular CDs, and then they'll see the free demo-based donation and the perceived value of their donations will be contrasted against the value of the, the flat CDs, the regular CDs. So what it'll do is it'll increase the amount of donations that you receive for the demos. So that's one technique you can employ um, with this um, model. So I, I don't know like if that, that answers your question the, or not. I feel like that'll make the demo even more valuable because it's like, okay, here's the full CD, but then you can hear like how I got there and, you know, these demos that birthed this CD, you know, some people give, you know, sell those demos or give them specifically to like people, you know, that are in their fan base or on their email list as kind of perks. So this could actually position the demo as being like a really cool, you exactly. know, fan, fan special thing. Um, that, exactly. you know, then they could take it if they wanted to, but if they took one, they'd probably be more likely to go and buy the CD as well. <laughs> exactly. And the yeah. reason for that is reciprocity. I'm sure mm -hmm. you've taught some of the people, you know, here re reciprocity, which is when you feel that, uh, you're indebted to somebody, when we give something to somebody, we feel like we owe them something back. So that's why this, one of the reasons this, um, 
uh, technique is so powerful, if you want to call it a technique, is because not only does it help you overcome some of your money blocks, but it also creates a sense of reciprocity in the person who you're giving this to. And they want to, in turn, a way to say thank you um, to buy something else from you, to support you. And it really creates a nice, I guess, framework, you can say, where you op- you're able to operate authentically in an environment where the exchange of money occurs as a result of a relationship and you have a lot of other opportunities uh, for people to, to um, support you financially. So I hope that answers your question or at least gives you some ideas to go off of. No, I think that's uh, but- really cool. And, and Carlene says you're very gutsy for like doing that the first time. And she was impressed that you got $13 the first time when you did that. And yeah, <laughs> I think it's really cool that you- I, I was that. too. <laughs> that's why- that's I was too. That's why I was so shocked by it. And I was like, oh, well, I, maybe I have something here. And that's, I did it the rest of the night. And I, you know, I perfected it over, you know, years, but every gig I play live now, I use that strategy and it works no matter whether, you know, I've played the venue before, whether anybody there has heard my band before, I can use that strategy and earn income. And I earn so much more income uh, than if I were to just you know, put my CDs on the table and try to sell them flat out. That's so interesting. So Jesse has a really good question and she wants to preface this by saying that she doesn't mean any offense by it, but you know, we're not the Beatles. Do people really want to hear our demos? No, they don't. (laughs) (laughs) I love that answer. They They want to support us, right? And you're giving them a way to do that. They like you and they want to support you. And the reason Um, The reason people don't, most of us don't earn income from our music isn't because people don't like our music is because we don't have the proper infrastructure set up to allow those people to pay us, or we make it as difficult as possible for the people who want to support us to pay us. So no, I guarantee you that those demos that I sold, I don't even think anybody probably listened to them. But what happened was they liked me. They appreciated that I took the steps to um, involve them and it started the relationship off right. But what happened was, is those people came to more gigs, right? Like they, and they eventually ended up buying music that they wanted to listen to. But in the beginning, for the most part, no. Yeah. And what you could do instead of do, if you didn't want to sell your demos, you could sell something totally different. Like say you decided to make acoustic versions of some of your favorite cover songs or something. You know, I kind of did this when people in my audience were asking me to, to do some record, some Broadway songs and classical songs that I perform live. I'm like, I'm not going to go into the studio and do that. I'll just make my own version at home. I'll make it really, you know, have it really cheaply made. um, And, you know, have that out here on my table. And it was super popular because that was what they wanted. And also it wasn't like the fully produced CD with the shrink wrap and all that stuff. So they felt like yeah. if, and plus then you can also kind of use that in a bundle effect as well, which, which will work really well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The point of the CD donation strategy for me is to kind of cut down the barriers that I experienced when not wanting to be a salesman. And it creates an opportunity to authentically begin a relationship with somebody that will ultimately bring them into my fan base and hopefully lead to a sale. Um, But that's a result, not the purpose. The purpose is to grow a relationship with somebody. The result ends up being that they buy something down the road and come to more shows. But um, I hope that answers the question. That that (laughs) yeah, no, it totally it totally does, and they're loving they're loving what you are, um, are saying here for sure. So I'm, I'm just kind of looking over like our conversation that we had, see if there was anything else that I wanted to bring out of that. Um, let's see. Yeah. I just, the thing that really gets me is that, that he said he doesn't want to take from people, which is so interesting to me i mean like that's how the world runs right that's every business if every business thought that way no business would ever make money yeah well that's i'm sure you know this like there's a perception that 
when you start a business, you have to change the way you think about it in that you have to think about how can I add value, not how can I t- get people to give me their money? Like yep. people give you their money as a result of adding value. If you don't add value, then you're not going to get their money. And I think that's something that I always thought incorrectly about before that I struggled with and I had to think about it differently. And just that one thing really, really helped me. I stopped figuring out, okay, how can I get people to give me their money? I started thinking about, okay, how can I add value and then make it as easy as possible for those people who I add value to, uh, to pay me in exchange for it. And then once I did that, I made money. It's like, totally, totally. Oh, this is one, this is one phrase that really caught my eye. So he said, I've just been doing this so long by myself that when people want to support me, it weirds me out. And I was like, (laughs) whoa, that's, I definitely felt that way. Like I felt like if someone's a super fan, I almost feel guilty. Like, do I really deserve being, you know, them being my super fan? What have I really done for them to make them want to support me so much? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you start to see people, uh, well, when you when you start to see people uh, come up to you and tell you how much they appreciate what you're doing, and you know what you're doing has done this for them, and how it's impacted their lives and helped them through, you know, whatever. No matter where you're at, like you, it feels uncomfortable. You know, I mean, like because we don't see ourselves in the way that others see us. We see ourselves as as us. So. I think there's a certain point where you have to know that comes with the territory. And I mean, the purpose of music, at least for me, is I want to impact other people in a positive way. And the result of impacting other people is that they're going to, you know, they're going to come to you. They're going to let you know that that had happened. So it's something that you have to know is that when that happens, that's a great thing. It means you're getting results and you're achieving your purpose through your music and kind of just embrace that weirdness and know that, okay, it's, it's okay. <laughs> um, and you just kind of deal it, deal with it with time, but yeah. And, and I think again, it's weird it always, for anybody. It is. And it comes back to thinking of your fans as friends too. Like everybody totally that's here agree. right now, like they're big supporters of what I do, you know, that everybody that's here right now on Indian or Indie interactive and I consider them all friends. So it's not weird. Like I love them. You know, I love what they're doing. Hopefully they love what I'm doing and it's a mutual relationship. And that's the way that we should think about our fans. Not like some weird, you know, the way we, we think about like huge celebrities, obviously we know we're not a huge celebrity, right? But there are people that do think about us that way. I remember one time when I first started performing at this um, Thursday night event at a church and it was a big deal. They, they did a lot of publicity for it. Like their whole church came out for it. And I was their main vocalist every Thursday night. And I even got in the newspaper and all this stuff, you know, but this one like preteen girl, she was like a huge fan of mine. I think she wanted to be a vocalist and it was so weird to me. Like she acted like I was a celebrity and it was very strange, but as time went on, I realized like, she just looks up to me. I'm a good example to her. I need to maintain that being a good example to her and be friendly and down to earth to her and not act like this, you know, so weird celebrity situation that the way she's seeing it. Cause you know, she's exactly. young, she doesn't know the difference. And so, you know, we just need to think of our fans as friends. I think that's, that's a way that we can get over this weird, the weird feeling of people supporting us. I mean, if we, you know, if something's going on in our life and one of our friends want to support us or take us out to lunch to make us feel better, we don't go, oh, that's weird, you know? Yeah. yeah. So so think about it that way for sure. Um, I just wanted to check and let's see. Just looking at it from the consumer eye. Cool. Um, how does paying for music work out? Yeah, so she's saying... How does paying for music work out consistently at at shows when so much of it is free online? And I I think it is all about the fan relationship. It's not, yeah, I mean, there's music everywhere. It may not be, you know, music that that we like. And, you know, that's why I think curation is so great because there is, there's free music everywhere. And if we want to hear music and get it for free, we can find it. 
we just want the opportunity to support the artists that we love. And I do think exactly. and I am so convinced after doing all these interviews for the summit that people still sell plenty of CDs live and yes. that can still be done. And Greg is obviously living proof because he was selling demos live. So if, <laughs> it's not about generally live. It's not about the CD and the quality. Like, again, no, they haven't not, heard not the actual mm -hmm. CD, right? It's just like the demo. They haven't heard the actual CD either, but they want to buy it as a memory, as a support tool. And so I think we exactly. need to think of it that way. And, and in, you know, like a memory in that they have it, they might want to have you sign it. And they want to remember that experience as that performance and support you. So we need to yeah. think about it that way for sure. Yeah. So this has been really awesome. And we are like at 40 minutes. So I don't want to go too long, especially because you can hear a lot more from Greg uh, on my interview during the summit. He is, I think he's on maybe day eight. So watch out for his interview. It's really, really good and really inspiring. Um, I did also want to highlight too, that many of us in the academy, and we're going to be expanding this out further, we are doing a special hashtag support after Indie Interactive every week. And we've decided to focus on the hashtag women play music. So hashtag women play music. And so we're going to be all posting into that hashtag throughout the week. And then during this time, right after Indie Interactive, we're all going to commit to go and start reposting and retweeting the things that are under that hashtag so we can help get more eyes on all of us and all of our music. So I think that's a really cool initiative that that Annie has brought to the forefront. So I just want to remind everybody about that and tell anybody that doesn't know that we'd love to have you um, do this with us right after Indie Interactive. We'll be going in and reposting and retweeting things in Twitter and in Instagram that are under the hashtag women play music. And I'm really excited about this. So just wanted to announce that before we end. Um, yes. Building relationships is, is all is women. I think it's women play music, right? Women play music. Yes. So it's women play music. Definitely. Okay. So thank you guys so much for showing up. This has been amazing. And I want to thank Greg for coming and doing this with us. He's in Europe right now. It's amazing. He's, he's got this like nomad mobile lifestyle where he is going throughout Europe and um, working at the same time and being able to be available for us on a totally different time zone. So thank you so much for that, Greg. We really appreciate it. And thank you all. Oh, my you pleasure. Absolutely. Up. And just be watching for Greg's uh, interview during the summit. I know you guys are going to learn a ton from him. All right. So thank you for showing up for Indie Interactive. We'll see you next week. And until then, keep making great music, connecting with your audience and growing your business. Bye, you guys.